Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracts, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracts Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracts and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world, and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. How do you do, my friend? Welcome to the broadcast today. It is a great day here at Bible Tracts Incorporated. We are enjoying the goodness and grace of God and His mercy. I hope you are very attuned and alert to the fact that God has grace and mercy in your life today. Life does not always go smoothly, does it? But God's grace and mercy are consistent. God cannot help but being merciful. God cannot help but being gracious. I hope that you and I both will have a regular habit of trying to spot the grace and mercy of our God in our day-to-day life. Well, right now, my Bible sits open to the book of 2 Peter. If you can at all, go there and join me. 2 Peter chapter 3, please. Along with getting your Bible out, get something on which you can jot some notes. We're giving an outline here today for the passage that's before us. But then not only will you have the pen and paper to jot down the outline, but you can jot down how to contact us so that we can give to you a free gift, a free sample packet of our gospel tracts. All we need is your name and address to do that. I'll say more about that here in just a minute. To get us ready for our Bible study here in 2 Peter chapter 3, let me begin this way. Please tell me that your household has faced some of the same financial questions that mine has at some point in time. Early in our marriage, particularly then, Nancy and I seemed to have more days in the month than we had dollars in the bank. You understand that, don't you? So decisions had to be made. Questions like, which expenditures are more important than others? Do we buy food first or put gas in the car first? The good news is is that we've not had to make that level of decision in a long, long time. Now, I bring this all up because in our Bible passage today, we're going to see the word first. It means first in importance or first thing to be attended to. Our Bible passage is certainly not addressed to a single family unit about their spending priorities. It's addressed to local churches about their protection priorities. So what is it that the Holy Spirit says is the first priority of a local church that is doing gospel ministry during this time period called last days? Get your Bible open, 2 Peter in chapter 3. Bible Tract Echoes, this radio program, is the radio arm of Bible Tracts Incorporated. As my announcer said, we publish gospel tracts in different languages. I have one of them in my hand. And before I talk about it, let me make sure you know what a gospel tract is. A gospel tract is a short written presentation of God's plan of salvation. In short, a gospel tract is an evangelism tool that you can give to somebody even when you cannot verbally tell them the gospel. The gospel tract in my hand right now is entitled, He Is Not Here. And on the front face is a beautiful picture of Easter lilies. And because of that, so many people say, well, I'm not going to use that track because it's an Easter track. Well, friend, you can look through this track and you will not find the word Easter here. This track is about the fact that Jesus' tomb is empty. It's about the resurrection. And last time I checked, when you read through the book of Acts in the first century church, they did not have a holiday called Easter, but they sure preached a lot about the resurrection. They used the truth of the resurrection as a bolstering point, as a main focal point in telling the gospel. And so should we. This particular gospel track says, he is not here. It's going to declare that Jesus Christ is the right man to deal with our sin. He is the risen man to deal with our sin, but he must be the received man for his salvation plan to be meritable to your 
life. Have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Here's a great gospel tool to tell others. He is not here. At the end of the program here, my announcer will give you three ways by which you can contact us, give us, again, your name and address. We will then send you free of charge a complete sample packet containing one each of all of our tracks, including this one. He is not here. Do that today, today, today. If your Bible is open to 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 3 and 4 with me. Here's what it says. Knowing this first, there's our word, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Stop, please, right there. Now, chapter three opens with a charge in the first two verses to believers that are living in the last days. The charge is to them to focus on what the Bible actually does say. The word focus was my outline title for verses one and two. My outline title for verses three through seven is that word first. As a local church is having all kinds of voices calling to it, trying to get its attention and trying to tell it what to believe, the church must fix its gaze on the established, knowable, and clear truth of the Word of God, truth that everybody can read for themselves in the Scriptures. With that kind of a solid rock holding a local church up, the church then has its first duty to beware of false teachers. Verses 3 through 7 are a paragraph, at least from my outline, and the whole paragraph helps us to accomplish this first duty. As I walk through verses 3 to 7, I'm going to deal with these issues. In verses 3 and 4, I'm going to talk about ridicule. In verse 5, I'm going to talk about refusal. In verse 6, I'm going to talk about reviling, the reviling done by these false teachers. And then in verse 7, I'm going to use the word repudiation. What is it these false teachers repudiate? But come here to verses 3 and 4, and let's look at the ridicule being done by those who are attempting to turn Bible-preaching churches away from the Scriptures. Two things come out here in verse 3 and in verse 4. The first one is this, the characteristics of these teachers. That's found in verse 3. As the, uh, these teachers are trying to undermine what God's people have been taught over the years, these teachers are going to scoff or ridicule the old time truth. Rather than using reasoning with believers based upon the scriptures, the false teachers ridicule. They make fun of the old truth. They mock the old truth. Why are they doing that? Well, part of the reason is given at the end of verse 3. Verse 3 ends by saying that these false teachers are living a life pattern of fulfilling sensual lusts. They don't want the Bible standards on holy living that are obviously openly found in the scriptures to get things away from that. They belittle other doctrinal truth claims so that they can then undo the Bible claims about morality. Now, when we were studying in chapter two of this book, we said this, when a Bible teacher has a messed up moral compass, don't listen to their message and don't follow their ministry. I'm going to say it again. When a Bible teacher has a messed up moral compass, don't listen to their message and don't follow their ministry. So their characteristic or their style of accomplishing their goal is to use ridicule. Whenever anybody on any issue uses ridicule as a major debate tool, you can already know they have no real truth or substance behind their opinion. But not only in verse 3 do we find the characteristic, but we also in verse 4 find a key question. A key question brought up by these false teachers. In verse 4, the false teachers are ridiculing primarily the second coming of Christ. Now, why in the world would they want to do that? The answer pretty much is simple. At Christ's coming, he's going to judge what? He's going to judge sin. 
And what are these false teachers practicing? They're, they're practicing sin. They're walking after their own lust. So the last thing that these false teachers want is the doctrine of the second coming with its accompanying judgment on sin and judgment on sinners. How do false teachers go about ridiculing the second coming? How do they do that? They do it by saying something like this, putting it, so, much, so to speak, in the voice of the mocker. They're saying stuff like, well, look around our world. Isn't it the same world that your parents and grandparents saw? It isn't the world gone on like this forever? Oh, God's never intervened yet. Why should we ever think he's going to step in and interrupt stuff into the future? That's basically what their argument is. There's a fancy word that describes that kind of a statement. It's called uniformitarianism. I'm going to say it again. It's called uniformitarianism. Now, you know what a uniform is. All the military people in every branch wears the same uniform. Kids going to school might wear a uniform, or people at a job might wear the same uniform. The word uniform simply means that things are the same. A person that teaches uniformitarianism is saying that things in our world have been the same in generations gone by, they are the same now, and they will remain the same all through the future. There is no change. There will be no change. God will not return. God will not judge. That, in essence, is uniformitarianism. Tomorrow, Lord willing, will see that their ideas don't hold water. Now, I just made a pun. If you read ahead into verse 5, you'll see why. Because tomorrow, we're going to look at water and how God has used water to intervene in the past. This thing called the Noahic Flood is going to come up. For today, though, here are three things we've got to learn. Three lessons to take away from 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Lesson number one is this. You and I must protect our churches from false teachers. How? By knowing the Word of God and basing what we believe on the clear statements of the Word of God. Lesson two, when we see people using ridicule and mockery to make their argument, whether their arguments about politics or economics or the Bible, when they use ridicule, we know that they are empty of truth. The third lesson is this, Jesus is coming again. As the old song says, we just don't know when, but he will come for his saints, and that may be today, and you and I need to be living godly lives in light of his soon return. Maybe you're listening today, and you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior, and you've bought into the idea that God is too loving and kind to judge. Well, God in his loving kindness, God in his grace and mercy has given you opportunity after opportunity to know about his salvation plan through the merits of Christ alone, who died on the cross, shed his blood, that you through him can have your sin debt paid for. You can't pay the debt. Christ paid it for you. And he offers you his salvation, his cleansing, his eternal life as a gift. But you have pushed it away and said no to it time and time again. When God comes to judge sinners, you'll have no excuse because in God's grace and mercy, he's offered you his pardon time and time again. Don't let it pass by today. Receive Jesus as your Savior now. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.